Welcome to the Facts vs. Feelings podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Dietrich, and I'm joined by my co-host, Sonu Varghese. Cutting through the noise in 30 minutes each week, taking out the boring and helping investors focus on what really matters. A quick note before we start the show, investment advisory services offered through CWM LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Carson Partners, a division of CWM LLC, is a nationwide partnership of advisors. All right, everybody, we are back with the 25th episode of Carson's Facts versus Feelings. We should have looked it up. We were just guessing what 25 is. Silver Jubilee, um, you know, gold explosion. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe. Uh, Platinum. Platinum, you know, but whatever, whatever it is, it's a 25th episode. And Sonu, my goodness, considering what we were talking about a week ago (laughs) to right now, what has happened out there, there is a ton to discuss. Everyone, again, welcome to the 25th episode with Ryan and Sonu. Clearly, we're going to focus a lot on Silicon, uh, Silicon Valley Bank and the potential fallout there. We are calling this week, the Fed broke it. I guess we've got to buy it. Right. I mean, that's the big thing is the Fed broke something. What does it all mean? And we're going to spend a little bit of time at the end uh, talking a look at what the Fed should do now. And then some pretty solid job numbers that we continue to say suggest we're probably not going into recession anytime soon. First things first, Sony, we are recording this on March 14th, otherwise known as Pie Day. Um, what is your favorite pie? Do you have a favorite pie out there? Uh, I'd say pecan, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. 3.14. You showed me something that was, dare I say, mind blowing. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll take it from there. Yes, I never knew this. I, I saw it on Twitter where I, I get either. all of my, I get all my good information on Twitter. You guys, do this for fun. Write down 3.14 and stand in front of a mirror. When you flip it backward, it'll say, pie. <laughs> <laughs> you Love it. cannot make that up. <laughs> Mind exploded. Mind exploded. My other favorite one is when they show a picture of a pie and like ah, maybe a third or fourth of it's gone. And then it says, you know, it's got the different colors. It's like pie I've eaten and pie I've not eaten. That's one of my favorite pie charts as well. There That's go. a good one. And just to let everyone know, we're going to get into it because there's a lot to discuss, obviously, this week. Sonu has his guitar next to him. At the end, he is going to strum some chords for all the listeners out there and send this off. And and I believe the song's going to be in the tune of Pi. Believe me, I'm not a try. musician, but is that how it's going to work? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll try. You know, we'll see where okay. it goes. <laughs> well, most people have no idea if you didn't do it right, but there's a few musicians that might know. But nonetheless, yes. he played a little bit for us, guys, and it was it was really good. All right, so Sonu, let's just dive in. Obviously, there's a lot to talk about. Real real serious stuff going on out there. Um. Silicon Valley Bank obviously was the was the 16th largest bank in the United States at the end of the year, $209 billion um, worth of assets. They went into, I believe it's called receivership um, from the FDIC on Friday. They vanished in 48 hours, right? I mean, literally on Tuesday, they were, it's not a knock on Forbes. I'm a huge fan of Forbes, but Forbes named them one of the top, top U.S. banks in 2022 on Tuesday. Their own website's talking about that. By Friday. For five went, years in a row, right? Five years in a row. I don't think they're going to get the sixth year in a row. But nonetheless, Sonu, um, what happened? I mean, you know, so many people kind of know. Maybe they don't. Let's keep it simple. But what in the world happened for the 16th largest bank? And, by the way, another large bank, Signature Bank, up in New York went under over the weekend. And then a crypto bank. um, I forget the name of the crypto bank. The crypto bank Uh, went under earlier in the week. Um, Silvergate. Silvergate. There it is. Silvergate. So what is going on out there? I, I know the banks are just in trouble. I mean, to the idea of the title for this podcast, you know, when the Fed breaks something, yep. I mean, we, I, I just saw this amazing reference from Jenna Smilek at uh, the New York Times on Twitter. She said, uh, she pointed to this old reference that look, when the Fed hits the brakes, somebody goes through the windshield. And we usually don't know who that is, but it turns out for now, it looks like it's Silicon Valley Bank or SVB. Uh, let me just jump in just for a second. What year? Was that said, by the way? I think that was the reference in 1941. That's when the New York right. Times referred to that. And uh, maybe you'll put a clip of that on Twitter or something. So it's a fun one. Yeah, the, the Fed was founded in 1913, by the way, down on Jekyll Island in Georgia. And I've been to Jekyll Island, beautiful little island. My joke is I looked up looking for helicopters spitting money. I did <laughs> not see any helicopters spitting out money on Jekyll Island. But so new again. <laughs> Within 48 hours, 16th largest bank gone. It was. A, here's my question to you. They say it's a run on a bank. 
that's kind of what did it because all this uncertainty and everyone's so intertwined anymore. Everyone at Silicon Valley, take a guess. They're very connected. They knew each other. Once yeah. it was trouble, like sharks in the or what was it? Blood in the water with a shark. Blood in the water. Everybody took their money out to the tune of forty-two billion dollars last Thursday is the number we saw. And that wiped the bank out. I mean, what else happened there? Yeah, I, I think look, uh, just to back up, let's uh mm-hmm. talk about what happened and uh, why it happened, right? And I'm thinking about Mary Poppins here and It's a Wonderful Life and you have like the runs of the banks. <laughs> yeah. But look, how does a bank make money, right? So you and I go and put money in the bank. That's a deposit. Mm-hmm. Now, an interesting question there is, you know, for all of you listeners too, when you put money in the bank, I imagine you think of it as you're putting it into a safety deposit box. Now yeah. for the bank, that's your asset, right? Now for the bank, it's a liability, right? Because they owe you that money and you can take it out anytime you want. So in a sense, you're a creditor to the bank, right? That's you're lending the bank money when you put a when you put money into a checking or savings account, right? Now on the other side, okay, uh, the bank has to give you services for that. Now on the other side, they need assets to counter that, right? Mm-hmm. And what do they what do banks usually do for assets? They loan, they make loans, right? And sometimes they make good loans. Sometimes they, they make terrible loans, like they did in two thousand eight, and all those you know people who took subprime mortgages, things like that, they couldn't pay their loans back and the ba- a lot of banks got into trouble for that. Yeah. Now, this is a little different and gets to the difference between what happened in 2008 and what happened to SVB over here. Uh, so SVB was part of this, as you said, the Silicon Valley crowd, right? They were you know, providing banking services to startups, venture capitals, PE firms, all mm-hmm. sorts of things. And think about what happened in 2020, 2021, There was money flowing all over the place to these startups, right? There was so much of money. These startups didn't need loans. They got money from IPOs. They could get money from secondary offerings. They could get money from SPACs. Do you remember that, Ryan? SPACs. (laughs) Wow, that was so 2021. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. So so when a startup gets money, what happens? They go and put those deposits in Silicon Valley Bank. Right. So Silicon Valley Bank had a ton of deposits because all this money is rushing into this, you know, tech startup crowd. Right. At the same time, for the assets, they didn't have a lot of loans. They weren't making a lot of loans. Right. So what did they do uh, to they need to make money on this? So mm-hmm. they went out and bought treasuries and mortgage backed securities. Right. Now, those have interest rate risk associated with, with it. Now, banks usually have some interest rate risk, but most banks tend to hedge it in some way. They're right. basically taking on credit risk, right? Where you go to your local loan officer at your regional bank or community bank, he knows you, he likes you, he thinks you're good credit, but he's taking some credit risk. I'm I'm lending money to Ryan Dietrich here. I think he's good for it. He's going to pay back, but there's some there's a credit risk there. That's the spread. That's how they make money, right? They charge you an extra premium, maybe mm-hmm. 4%, while they pay depositors 1%, right? That 3% spread is the money they make the net interest margin. Silicon Valley Bank didn't make a lot of loans. So they went and said, oh, you know you know what? We can get one and a half, two 2% on treasuries or mortgage-backed securities and pay practically zero to these depositors. What happened? The Fed raised rates and something was going to break. Now we know what broke. Their balance sheet broke, right? The assets lost value because when rates went from one and a half, two 2% to four and a half, five 5%, the value of the bonds they held just crashed, right? So when everyone went to take money out, they didn't have capital. That's basically what happened. Yeah. So that's a, again a traditional run on the bank. It's um they yeah. they invested a lot. Now believe me, you wait two hours. There's new information out there. What I've heard, what I've read, <laughs> they invested a lot in longer term treasuries around one and a half percent. When the ten year yield was around one and a half percent, ten year yield right. up closer to five. It did come back right. a little bit lately. Yes. Nonetheless, um, that caused a lot of unrealized losses on their balance sheet. And then they had to raise some capital, had to sell some bonds at, I believe, a $1.8 billion loss last Wednesday. Um, Thursday morning, the CEO comes out, said everything's fine. Literally 24 hours later, the company doesn't exist anymore as we knew it. Now, um, you know, there's a lot of questions that are swirled in my head, but let's maybe move forward. What did the Fed, the FDIC, and oh, there was somebody else here, three of them. Uh, Treasury. Treasury. Uh, yeah, Treasury. Janet Yellen. Don't How forget Treasury. Forget Janet? <laughs> exactly. Speaking of the Fed, Janet Yellen out of 16 Fed chairpersons was the shortest out of all the Fed chairpersons, but the stock market had a really good run under Janet Yellen. So what happened on Sunday? Because Sonu is the way I Sunday understand night. it. Sunday night, they said, hey, you know what? 
Remember, there's something called FDIC up to uh, $250,000. Your money's insured. If you have more than that, I believe the average account with SVB was like $4 million. So a lot of their assets were not, it were, I don't want to put this, uninsured. Uninsured. As far, yeah. as, as, far as I understand it, the Fed came out and all this, this, you know, this uh, conglomerate came out on Sunday night and said, listen, everything's backed. You're going to get your money back on Monday morning. Do not panic. They said this for this in Signature Bank. Is that kind of the simplest way to put it? I, I That's it, right? So if you're, say, a mid, say if you're running a company in Cincinnati, Ohio, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. you had, say, 250, 300 employees, and you have to make payrolls. So you, there's obviously money in the bank, and it's going to be a lot more than 250000 Now, what do you think about if, you know, on Friday afternoon or Sunday afternoon, you think, wait a minute, is my bank good for this? right? My regional yeah. bank, right? Yeah. So the worry is, you know, come Monday morning, I'm going to move all those mon- all those funds out because I need to meet payroll for the next couple of months or whatever it is. I'm going to move those funds out to Bank of America or JP Morgan mm-hmm. or Citigroup. I don't love those guys. I love my local community banker, regional banker. I, you know, I know them. Right. I have dinner with them. I have drinks with them, but I'm going to move it out. I'm worried about their balance sheet, right? To prevent that, what the Fed Treasury and FDIC came in and said, is, uh, look, we are going to make everyone whole. Insured, obviously, they're always made whole mm-hmm. up to the tune of 250000 But we're going to make everyone above that whole as well, just so that there's no panic across America mm-hmm. come Monday morning. And then the other side of it is they also, this is a little more technical, where they made a new lending facility available to right. banks. So if banks need capital, like you just pointed out, a lot of these banks have treasury securities, mortgage-backed securities that have lost value because the interest rates went up. Now, they don't. if they go to the market and sell it, they have to realize that loss. So instead, what the Fed has said, wait a minute, don't do that. Come to us. If your bond is worth, say, $90 instead of $100, we will give you $100 for now, for a year. You take it back after the year. You solve, you know, you're well capitalized, mm-hmm. all of that. But we'll, we'll give you that $100. For something that's worth less. That's basically what the Fed did, did on uh, yeah. Sunday evening. It's yeah. interesting how yeah. these things always happen on weekends, right? Remember Bear Stearns and, you know, yeah. and even the FDIC, anytime they shut a bank down when they walk in, it's always on Friday afternoon. And now it's, mm-hmm. with SVB, I think it was Friday morning, they shut the doors, right? right? So that they can find a resolution over the weekend. But it's sort of like, I, I, I'd love to be there. I, I mean, you know, you never wish this on any bank or anything, but I'd love to see it. Like, how do they walk in through the doors? Is it like 50 of 50 people from the FDIC come with briefcases or something, you know, say, you know what, shut the doors. We're taking over. Like, you know, that, that's, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's ooh, like a movie. Gotta, <laughs> it's got to, I was going to say like Wolf of Wall Street, right? When they have all the feds come in, it's, that's never good. That's never yes, good. Um, never so, good. so let's, let's dive in a little bit more here. I mean, this is just such an interesting uh, concept. We're w- really living through history because again, we went 860 days without a bank in the U S failing. Then we had three just last yeah. week that failed. I mean, so my question then is, you know, kind of who's to blame. All right. Like everybody wants to put blame on somebody. Is it the Fed's fault for raising rates? Is it the SVB's fault for, listen, the Fed said they're going to raise rates. Why'd you put in a bunch yeah. of long-term treasuries? Or, or by the way, the majority of their money went to tech companies. As we just talked about when Silicon Valley slowed down, how many IPOs you hear about on TV anymore? How many SPACs you hear about? How many private equity? You're not, those, those things aren't really working like they were from 2015 to, um, 2015 to 2021. Who is to blame? I'll answer it first. My opinion, I hate to say, I guess VB, I mean, you know, they, they, they knew the Fed was raising rates. They had all these long-term treasuries. They should have diversified their portfolio, and they didn't. And that's, I think, one of the comforting things is devastating what happened to people, lost their jobs, and people that were super scared with what's going to happen to their money. I think what's comforting to the market is, listen, a lot of other places aren't designed like this particular bank was. And I, I kind of I hate to say it's all on the, the bank, but a lot of these guys lost their jobs, right? Uh, the, the, all the people in charge of that bank no longer employed. Um, so I kind of say it's more on SVB, and that's comforting. What, what do you think? I'm with you. I'm with you. Look, look their chief risk officer left, I think, uh, several months ago, yeah. and they didn't even right. bother replacing that person. That tells you what they were. You know, yeah. <laughs> come on. Well, they had that right. award from Forbes. They were in no hurry. <laughs> yeah, they so, I, I mean, it gets to the fact that I think you nailed it, right? Their deposit base was very concentrated. And in mm-hmm. this age of, I mean, we talk about Mary Poppins and, you know, it's a wonderful life. Yeah. To get money out of your bank, you had to line up, right? Now, in the mm-hmm. age of social media, what was interesting, I was, you know, following this on Twitter, apparently there were like 200 
VCs and tech found, tech startup yep. founders on a WhatsApp group. And they said, get your money out, get your money out. Yeah. Right. So Thursday evening, everyone got their money out. And you can do yep. this with, a, you know, on your computers or your phones right now. Yeah, it was right, the first so. time, again, that WhatsApp, as far as we know, a WhatsApp group took out the 16th largest bank in the United States. Again, that, <laughs> there's pros and cons we talk about to the connectivity of the world, or one tweet does this, or one one blog post does this. There's positives. It was great when their their deposits were flowing, money was flowing, and then it's – Actually, I have a question for sword. you on that. Yeah. Do you, think, do you think of this as a bailout? Mm-hmm. No. I don't. Um, a great question. That's one of mine. You know, is it a bailout or not? I mean, if you own the bonds, you lost money. If you own the stock, you lost money. Yes, they're helping clearly these companies that invested in the bank. But I mean, it's such a it's not it's not there's nothing black and white about this. Let's yeah, be very clear. I, I think. But, but to me, um, you know, I don't, I don't think it's a bailout. I mean, people there are a lot of people that lost their jobs. A lot of people that lost money. Um, and and it, it obviously impacted not just SVB. I know we're recording this on Pi Day in the morning. Big regional banks are jumping significantly. But on Monday, we said, hey, the Fed backstop things. Things should have been calm. A lot of these big banks were down anywhere between 50 to 20 percent. These smaller, smaller, sorry, smaller regional banks, even large banks are down a couple percent. Um, So there's clearly been some losers in this. So to me, it's not a bailout. I know everything is political. Believe me. I mean, I honestly thought this time a week ago, you and I'd be talking about Powell, where he's getting grilled by honestly both sides. (laughs) Yeah, both sides of the aisle, left and right, are both yelling at Powell a week ago at this time now we're all that was we're experts on the fed now we're all experts in, in bank runs a week later is kind of how that worked um but i don't think it was a bailout what do you think i, I think look it's interesting remember we started this conversation with uh if you put money in your bank do you think of it as if you're lending money to the bank right now you mm-hmm. and i don't mm-hmm. i don't think anyone no, listening to this probably no. does but the bank sees it right. as borrow they're borrowing money mm-hmm. right so when you say when you're making uninsured depositors whole in a sense it's it's like yes we're making creditors to the bank whole in that sense i would say oh yeah that's what happened with aig it made aig's creditors whole it's kind of like a bailout but in this case you know no mom and pop or even tech company you know whatever you think about them they put money in the bank they were getting mm-hmm. services some of them had no choice right they were accepting yeah. money from vcs who said you have to bank with svb right so mm-hmm. and, and anytime you're banking look Nope, none of us are going through the bank's balance sheet line item by line <laughs> trying to figure out, okay, is this bank good, a good place to put my money in? It's a, it's a bank, right? Yeah. And you, put your, you trust and put your money in. Uh, absolutely. I'll say so. When I lived in Charlotte, I banked with Wells Fargo, moved up to Cincinnati, and now I have, uh, when I get paid, and we just got paid today, by the way, um, I looked and my money was there. I used Fifth Third. Fifth mm-hmm. Third's one of those small regional banks yeah. that were right in the crosshairs of a lot of things that were happening yesterday. Good news is my money showed up at both of my banks this morning for payroll. So thank you to Carson Group and thank you to the two banks to make sure that money was there. Um, but, you know, it just that's the fear that's out there. Yeah. You know, should I get a couple different banks? Should I do this? And, and believe me, you know, when you're losing your that's money, tough. you turn on TV and financial markets are melting down in front of your eyes. Again, bouncing on Pi Day. We'll see where things close by the time people listen to this. Um, but so the two more things I wanted to talk about here because you and I could probably talk on this for an hour. In fact, I think we have actually before. Um, but two more I want to talk about. Why did no one see this? coming i mean there's some people that are claiming they saw it coming and maybe the easiest way to put it is the stock price saw this coming because the stock price was hit significantly from where it was at the same time moody's s p had this rated investment grade this time a week ago um if you look at analyst buy so hold ratings like all buys all outperforms oh, maybe a couple holds like no sells I, I mean there's a few people on the dark web that are saying they saw this coming but man a lot of people didn't. Why did nobody see it coming? I mean, I like to follow. I know you follow prices. I like to follow price. The price yep. usually tells a story. Price yep. didn't tell you that SVB was going to fail, right? Like you said, most analysts mm-hmm. had a buy rating or at least mm-hmm. hold. I don't, I, I don't know if anyone had a sell rating on this uh, stock, right? I don't think they did. <laughs> yeah. I don't think they so, did. Yeah. There you go. And so it, it's hard to say that, you know, it's not coming. But yeah, look. That's the thing, right? When we going back to the title of the podcast, right? If the Fed mm-hmm. hits the brakes, like I said, something's going to break. But it's hard to figure out what exactly will break. Now, the most obvious thing that was that broke, I would say, was housing last year, right? We know housing activity has yeah. crashed, housing sales, all of that. That's that's the most obvious way in which rate hikes immediately impact the economy, right? I, and I'm sure there are a lot of loan officers and you know all, all the people involved. When you close a home, 
that industry is suffering right now because there's not a lot of home buying activity, right? So it's not like rate hikes haven't impacted anyone, right? Like if you ask people in that, you know, in that sector of the economy, they'll say, oh yeah, this has been horrible, right? Because mm -hmm. they're, they're probably out of a job. They're not being able to service loans, whatever it is, right? Or people who refinance and things like that. So it's not like I mean, just, this is the first impact, but yeah, this is the most. Yeah, this could be a system. Could have been a systemic financial crisis. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned housing. Just drive around your neighborhood. I remember you know, a year or two ago, like all the houses were for sale. It felt like now there's like no houses for sale. I mean, it, it, it's 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 unique. And again, are people looking to move when you know they got a mortgage locked in sub three percent? They got to go somewhere else for four or five, five or six percent. You know, I don't know. The bigger questions for a different day. But but the bottom line is, yeah, the Fed broke something. And now we kind of got to pick it up, but we think hopefully we're not going to, um, you know, we can put this back together and we can, we can keep going. So, Soda, we need to wrap this up, but what now, right? I mean, this is, believe me, this is the, it's the age old question. Maybe we dropped the crystal ball or it's a little foggy, but what now? I mean, regional banks are in the crosshairs. They were just decimated. They're bouncing today on yeah. Pi Day. Um, what do you think will be the fallout from all this? I think the next big question is what the Fed does, right? They've sort of ring fenced. Yep. With what uh, with the actions on Sunday, with along with FDIC and Treasury, sort of ring fenced, you know, the issue. I think, uh, dare I say, I mean, famous last words, but I say we're not going to have a financial crisis because of this, right? They've done what it mm -hmm. takes, and and maybe that's because of lessons they learned in two thousand eight. You remember twenty twenty? They acted really quickly, right? We didn't have a financial crisis. Sure. We did have an economic crisis, but we didn't have a financial crisis, right? Financial crisis can mm -hmm. quickly impact the economy. You don't want that especially now since the economy seems to be, you know, getting back on track and things like that. But uh, going back to the point of uh, what happens next, I think the big question is, okay, if so far Powell and the Fed were like, we are going to fight inflation no matter what it takes. In fact, Rich Clarida, who is uh, Powell's second and, you know, he was second in charge at the Fed, it said, we are a single mandate central bank right now. Our mandate is to fight inflation. Well, they have another mandate, which is employment, but another one is also financial stability. And now right. financial their mandate is financial stability. It's not quite an explicit mandate, but it's obviously there. That's just clashed headlong into their mandate to fight inflation. The question is what happens next. And I, I think they pause. They take a break from raising rates maybe in March. That's what the market's expecting them to do. And mm -hmm. take a breather, everyone. Let's just figure something out, you know, some things are breaking. Let's not get too ahead of our skis here. But I don't think they're done with rate hikes because we just got inflation data too. Inflation's still higher than they want. Yeah, good points there. So we'll take a break from that. We'll we'll dive into the Fed here in a, in a second. Um, so I was driving around this morning. had the, had a doctor appointment follow up to my surgery, which I'm doing fine. Everything's That's pretty good. good. So it is snowing in cincinnati this morning like not a lot sure it's not sticking but it's snowing it's like march madness i mean that's crazy i used to live in the south where i didn't have these problems what's it like in chicago you get any snow i know there's some rough weather across the uh across the whole united states right now at least eastern part of the united states is it snowing in chicago how no, you doing it's nice and sunny here in chicago except it's 20 degrees Good. outside so i'm not well going there out. you go <laughs> there you go <laughs> anyway so yeah so there's snow so if you're dealing with snow on pie day that is just ridiculous but all right so the next concept we were going to talk about was the fed you kind of talked some about it we've got a fed meeting coming up uh the cpi this morning we haven't had a ton of time to dive in i know core came in a little bit hotter than expected some other things seem to be there look like services are still kind of running hot shelters running hot i feel like a broken record overall yes the headline numbers trending lower but those same sticky, troublesome areas are still just tricky, troublesome areas. I guess I'll put it like this. A week ago, you and I were talking about this. We said, you know what? How, how crazy is this, by the way? A week ago, 80% chance of a 50 basis point hike. Now there's a legit chance of no hike at all, right? If you look at Fed Fund Futures, and maybe even, who knows, maybe even a cut if things <laughs> kind of spiral cut, out of control. Yeah. How fast has that changed? I mean, my goodness, there's no chance of 50 point basis point hike as of now. It can change. But again, the, I'm with you. I think, I think the Fed just takes a break in March, then maybe the hike once or twice yeah. more is that kind of, i mean believe me this is so fluid by the time someone listens to this i'll think we're crazy to even say it like that because <laughs> the news is moving so fast but that's kind of what i'm seeing what do you think so I, on your front i think i'm there, right there with you on that <clears throat> i think mm -hmm. they take a break yeah. now they get back to look <clears throat> coming to the inflation data if you just average i mean year over year core inflation like if you strip out energy and food 
It's about five and a half percent, right? But that's year over year. That's a long period of time because you're taking into account February to 2022 numbers as well. Just look over the last three months, right? Inflation running about 5%, 5.2%, three-month annualized mm-hmm. pace. That's that's high. That's elevated. It's not as bad as, you know, it was close to 10% more than a year ago. It's not as bad as that. So inflation's come down, no question. Inflation's come down. But it's st- it, we've sort of stalled at this point. Mm-hmm. Things have gone yeah. sideways for a few months now. Now, I, I know, I think you and I agree that, you know, as the months progress, they'll probably see, I, I think things, inflation will start falling. Rent, rents yep. are decelerating in the private market. That should feed into CPI. Wage growth, we have pretty strong evidence that wage growth is decelerating. We saw ECI from last quarter, wage growth numbers from right. January and February, that's decelerating. That should feed into the CPI. But for now, it's not. It's all high. I mean, I was just looking at, like, Ryan, here's a number for you. Lodging away from home. There's a category within CPI. Yep. Hotels and motel things like that. As people travel, they're spending mm-hmm. money on hotels and things like that. For the last three months, annualized annualized pace, up 23%. Wow. 23%, yeah. right? Car and truck rentals, for up 14%, annualized rate over the last three mm. months. These are big numbers. Right. I saw lettuce was down 5%. So <laughs> yeah, at, least we're, at least lettuce is cheaper. Go eat your I, salad. I think I saw also... Yeah, exactly. I've been, believe me, I've been eating a lot of salads with my stomach issues. I've been having. Uh, I'm down like 20 pounds to start the year, so I'm just trying to trek mm-hmm. with uh, what the stock market's doing. You know? <laughs> so anyway, um, with that though, you think about it. Um, I also saw airline air airfare air, air air was yep. was pricier, which again, not a shock. Just go to an airport. But so do we've got about five minutes or so, and I know everyone is sitting at the edge of their seat to listen to you play your guitar to strum us away. I'll just end it with this. We might have had more volatility in the uh, shorter-term yields we've ever seen. The two-year yield yesterday, that was Monday, was down 61 basis points. That's the largest one-day drop since when? Since the day after the 87 crash. Over three days, down 100 basis points. Again, largest three-day drop in two-year yield since right after the 87 crash in October 82 before that. Look back in your history books. October 82, October 87 after the crash were not the worst times to look for some potential upward price action, even though the bond market was freaking out. And again, maybe it's saying the Fed is pivoting. I mean, yeah, there could be another hike coming. But when you see the two-year do moves like that, it's pretty clear. I think, you know, I'm, uh, who is it? A uh, Gunlock. Gunlock. Uh, Big Bill's fan. Yep. He says that, um, over. Uh, he says, that, you know, the Fed follows the two-year. Two-year leads the Fed. Well, that's kind of telling you something. So, again, we'll dive more into that probably next week. Mm-hmm. But just really fascinating movements. And one final comment. Yes, the stock market sold off hard. One nice thing, yields have sold off also, meaning bonds have done quite well. So, sure, your stock portfolios are down over the past week, but your bonds have given you some zig when stocks zag, something right. we didn't see last year, something we said exclusively, yeah, we still like stocks more than bonds this year, but you're going to get something from your bonds, so stick with some bonds. Yep. A lot of people said don't just get rid of bonds. We didn't, we didn't think you should yep. get rid of bonds, and they're giving you that diversification. All right, so the final thing we wanted to talk about was what? Um, oh, the jobs number. Oh, yeah. uh, but before we go there, it's NCAA brackets season um i don't know if you're a huge basketball fan let's put it on record who do you think will win the brackets have you had a chance to look into that yet? Uh, i haven't looked into yet into it yet but purdue i i went i spent six years at purdue so oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I can't say anything different then you, you, yeah. well, and you're with this, xavier's right I'm a Xavier guy with the Xavier Cincinnati, and they're a three seed, which is a little surprising. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stick with the Big East, though. I, I'm mm. going to say UConn. I think UConn's a really uh-huh. good team. Could be pie on my face. Oh, no pun intended. It's pie day. Um, But, you know, we'll, we'll see. But anyway, so hopefully everybody has fun filling out their brackets and can enjoy some of that stuff. All right, so so do the jobs number, 311, the band 311 all mixed 311. up. The, 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 we, made a pl- we made a playful um, – blog take on that 311 was stronger than expected 311,000 jobs the previous month remember 517 revised down to 504 we all assumed to be revised down that <laughs> wasn't revised down very much though so you're still talking 800,000 jobs the past two months the um the um the wage growth came in lower than expected i mean honestly last friday i would have thought it was a pretty decent number even today's um cpi like nobody's talking about cpi on cnbc right now like we've <laughs> we used to always focus on these jobs over cpi now we got, we got another shiny object to look at a very important shiny object 
subject. But the thing that I thought fascinated me, um, you write a daily note for our Carson partners, and you pointed out something I've heard before, but I've, I've never kind of knew, knew much about it. The Psalm number. I hope I said that right. Yeah, S-A-H-M. Yeah. Tell us who came up with the Psalm rule. Who came up with that, and what was that telling us regarding jobs and an infl- a um, recession? It's like, uh, an economist, a former economist from the Fed, Claudia Sam. So she used to do a lot of work at the Fed. I think she was in D.C. Mm-hmm. Uh, so right in the heart of it all. And she created this indicator called the Sam rule. It's simple. It, it's to tell you whether you're in a recession or not. It's, it doesn't tell you whether yep. a recession will happen six months from now. But it, it's a good indicator. What you know, where are we today? Right. So it says if you take the three month average of the unemployment rate right now, that's at three point six percent. If you take the three month average, yep. last three months of that, if that's. 0.5% higher than, you know, the lowest unemployment rate we've seen over the last 12 months, then in all likelihood, you're in a recession. And that's worked across the board. Right now, we are like mm-hmm. half a percent or so below that, maybe more than half a percent. I think at like 0.7% or something below, you know, what we've, uh, what we've seen over the last 12 months. So mm-hmm. all this to say, we're not in the middle of a recession. And look, economies don't mm-hmm. tip into a recession. Like, like stock prices can go down 20% within two, three weeks, right? Economies, yeah. co- COVID notwithstanding, that was, you know, a massively, like a massive black swan kind of event for the economy mm-hmm. but where, you know, government shut things down, businesses shut things down, all of that. And all of us are at home. But other than that, economies don't tip into a recession, you know, from one month to the next. It takes some time, Right. And mm-hmm. payrolls, you look at payrolls. Why do we look at payrolls? Because it tells you how much, you know, money is being earned by people. And that's going to give you an idea about consumption, right? Employment times hours worked times wages. All of them are fairly strong. That's aggregate income across the entire economy. And that's going to be spent. Most Americans tend to spend most of their incomes. And that's why 70% of GDP is uh, consumption, right? So it's a good sign when employment is running strong. Um, So obviously I'm employed. Like I said, I got paid by both my banks this morning and I had to go to my doctor this morning and I stopped at the vet. My dog, Walter, I've talked about Walter, my 131 pound great Pyrenees. Actually, yeah, he's over to my right. He's just snoring away over there. I said, let's go to work. Go to work means let's go down to the basement. He just knows go to work. So we're going to work right now. I stopped at his vet to get him um, some monthly pills. It's like a combination heartworm and um, I don't know, a couple different things all in one pill. It was $216. Wow. I'm like, you're kidding me. I love the dog, but gee whiz. I mean, that, that's for six <laughs> months worth. But nonetheless, when you see things like that, we're, I think, and I joked about the Taylor Swift thing. My daughter well, bought those Taylor Swift tickets last, oh, whenever that was, April, give or take. I forget what yep. it was. And everybody tried to buy them. Ticketmaster broke. We all remember it. But half jokingly said, there's no way you're in a recession when people are paying these prices. The, apparently, Taylor Swift's first tour starts this weekend down in uh, out in Arizona, Glendale. My daughter's like, oh, let's fly out there. I was like, no, we're not flying out there to watch Taylor Swift. She's going to see it in Cincinnati. What I'm getting at, she was looking at them. Those tickets are still going for a couple thousand bucks wow. each. Now, I'm not saying people are buying them. I'm saying that's what they're selling for. The Taylor Swift indicator tells me we're not in a recession or headed to. By the way, CPI, right, everyone, pet, that services, yep. pet, ser- vet, vet oh. services, 2.2%. That's a monthly increase, uh, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. I'm part of it. I'm part of it. I guess I'll be almost next month, I guess. It'll keep going up next month on a sticky inflation. Um, but everyone, that is a wrap on the 25th episode of Carson's Facts versus Feelings with Ryan and Sonu. Again, titled it, The Fed Broke It. I guess we bought it. And we are going to end it oh, yeah. with the great Sonu Varghese strumming some chords on Pi Day. So, Sonu, I guess just I'm going to sign off. We'll see everybody next week. Oh, by the way, before you do that, next week, who's our who's going to join us? Oh. This is a big one, right, Sonu? Mr. Stocks for the Long Run himself, uh, Jeremy Siegel. Mm-hmm. Professor Jeremy Siegel yes. from the University of Washington. Professor and- Siegel. So that, yeah, I'm like a fanboy. That's going to be awesome. Yeah, I'm like getting chills. That's going to be awesome. I've seen, you've all seen him on CNBC. He gets all fired up about the Fed. I'll maybe try to say something to get him fired up on our podcast just to get some reaction out of him. But he is awesome, obviously. Uh, whether you love him, you hate him, you listen to him. Jeremy Siegel is one of the greats in our industry, and we are just so honored he's going to join our podcast. But we're going to end it with this honor. So, Navargis, start playing your guitar, and then we're going to sign off. We'll yeah. see you right next week with Dr. Professor Siegel. Let's hear it. What do you? Going to do but, and this is in the tune of pi right, right. i'm gonna stop talking take it away i mean you know music you have notes c d e f g a b 
right? So seven nodes. And uh, you take think of pi, you put uh, 3.14, right? So you take three is A, B, C, C is your starting chord, right? And then you just go from there. So, and then so. Play one of my more favorite songs, which kind of, you know, there's a D in there, a D minor. And we'll fade. So, this one I'm supposed to yell free bird. Sultan's a swing for any dire straits there fans go. out there. That was awesome, Sonu. That was really, really cool. I bet by popular demand, you're going to have some more requests. You better, you better uh, get get a little better on the well, – not get better. Better is the wrong word. Learn a few more tunes. <laughs> oh, I, 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 mean. I should awesome. probably that get awesome. better. I, I don't play as much as I want to. But. Ah, that was that was good. Everybody, 25th episode is done. Sonu playing his guitar. You didn't see that coming, did you? <laughs> we'll be back next week with Professor Siegel. It's going to be an amazing discussion. We're here for you. Thank you for everyone who keeps listening to this podcast. You keep listening. We'll keep doing it. See everyone next week. Take care.